us. Okay, so first off, uh, thank you all for being here. A couple of admin notes real quick. Any questions for Bill either before or after these webinars should be sent to voiceoverexpert at gmail.com um, just to let you know. But also just to let you know, Bill's schedule has gotten so unbelievably hectic that really, Bill, the better way for people to get those questions asked is every two weeks on these webinars, correct? And that's really the reason we're doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, you see a few other things. Can you see my screen, Bill? I can. Okay. Also, we only take and use questions that are asked while the webinar is in progress. Unfortunately, many times we can't even get to all of those. So, um, and I will, you know, just sort of sort through and figure out what's going on. Now, uh, a little good news, though, for everybody, which is this, now that I've talked about that stuff, is this 50% off coupon. $50. Is going to be $50 off. $50 off, right. A $50 off coupon is going to be used for one specific program, and that's going to be good until when, Bill? Two weeks from tonight, 9 o'clock Central, 48 hours from um, tonight. Oh, 48 hours total. So yeah. $58 off for the next 48 hours for this program, which is 100 video questions, which makes sense because we're doing the question and answer session. So I think that makes sense. The most frequently asked okay. questions that I receive, in-depth answers. Okay, perfect. And that's uh, available, like I said, folks. And uh, please take a look at that. So if you go to this website, 100 VO questions, and use this code when you order, you will get this amount off. Okay, so let's get to some of those questions right now. Let me see here. What do we got? And I'm going to see here. Um, okay, let's take a look here. Um, Okay, Bill, when using social media to promote, this is by from Denny, by the way. Denny asks, Bill, when using social media to promote a voiceover business, what are some things someone who is relatively new as a voice talent can post to the various sites that would generate the interest of potential clients? I really don't use social media uh, directly to promote my voiceover business. I think there are far more effective ways than social media. The way I do use social media is this way. Uh, I do have some of my clients that have chosen to follow me on social media, which is great. So whenever I do something that's noteworthy, for instance, uh, I recently did a project for Disney, which is now uh, up on one of their websites. And so I posted that on Facebook because that was an, you know, Disney carries a lot of clout. So I put that up on my profile so that my clients could see that I did something for Disney. So that generates confidence in them. I don't do it all that often, though. It's every once in a great while. If it's noteworthy, I'll put it up. But otherwise, I really don't use social media to promote my business. Good one. Okay. Uh, Brian is asking, aside from Voices.com and Voices123, where do the higher paying jobs come from? He's getting between 100 to 250 bucks uh, type jobs on average. Uh, is it yeah. only agents that get the higher dollar jobs? I can answer that for you. The answer is no on that last part of the question. Why don't you tell them why? Yeah, well, I mean, there, there are, you know, there, there are plenty of jobs out there. For instance, I was contacted the other day by a, a gentleman in Florida to do a TV commercial for the city of Orlando. The job pays five thousand dollars. That didn't come through an agent. Um, I'm not saying that I get those offers every day, but a lot of those do come through voice123voices.com, uh, people who find me through doing web searches. But ultimately, the majority of the bigger jobs do come th from agents, but not exclusively. And so, Bill, that's, yeah. So, in other words, don't think that when you get an agent, like Bill, tell, share with people, I think we've done this before, what percentage of your total income this year, percentage total, has come via agents. It's less than five percent, probably three to four percent. Three to four percent, and this year you're going to do over two hundred k, aren't you? Yeah, I'll do close to two hundred fifty. Okay, there you go. So that's your answer. Um, whether you should contact your client, potential clients, by email or call by phone. Is that Stennis's question as well? Yeah, um, I always I always believe that phone is more effective when you have the time. Sometimes it's not practical because of time zone differences, especially when you operate as a global talent. In other words, contacting clients in Europe or India, it's not practical uh, to phone. But anytime you can make a phone call to introduce yourself, it's always more effective because it's it's a personal touch. Uh, but that being said, I've certainly sent more emails than I've ever made phone calls just because it's more practical. I can do a higher volume. And George Weaver is asking the, the very Hamlet-esque question to Slate. 
or not to slate. <laughs> uh, I, I never slate. Uh, and the, for those of you who do not know what slating is, maybe you're brand new. It's simply where you give your name uh, at the beginning or the end of your audition. This is Bill Moving on voices.com or those kinds of things? I never, I never slate my name um, Got it. on those places. Only when an agent asks me to do I. Okay. Why is there not a lot of discussion, Quincy is asking, regarding the business, i.e. retirement, savings, taxes, insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Quincy, because people don't ask. They're more interested, actually, in the VO questions. And right. Bill, although a brilliant man in many ways, <laughs> is neither a tax authority or a retirement specialist or an insurance agent. So, I mean, he could probably give you some of the stuff he does, and I'm not trying to be flip. Yeah, but, no, I mean, it's sure. No, and I, you're you're absolutely right, Fred. And it's you know it's this it's the same information that would be applicable to any self-employed person, which means you have to take responsibility for all of those things yourself. I would recommend having a good accountant, number one, which I do. I would recommend working with a financial planner as well. At the very least, you should make sure that you are uh, you know you have a four hundred one k or an IRA or or some place where you can uh, be putting money away for you know for for your later years. And if you don't know how to do that or how much to do that, a financial planner w would certainly help. But when it comes to specific, people ask me about, well, incorporate or LLC or sole proprietorship. You know, it depends on your situation, where you live and what you're sitting, you know, talk to an accountant about those things because you may need to set up differently than me to take best advantage of your situation. Question from Ian that really relates to the item we're promoting right now, which is how do I get started in the voice of your business if I'm brand new? Well, a good place to start would be this particular one, the 100voquestions.com, especially using that code that we gave you, the 50 off, because it, it does answer. I mean, Bill, do you think that's the best place for somebody new to start? I, I think it's a really good place to start because it does answer, you know, most of the questions that you're going to have. And well, and let me just give you a more direct answer to where do I start? Because that's one of the things I will address in this program. And, it, and you really should start with some good training. And um, you really can't do anything until you know what to do and how to do it. And that comes through training and preparation. Next step is going to make sure that you have a good home studio. Next step is to record a professional demo. And then the next step is to market yourself. So that's, my, that's really a four-step plan. But this top 100 questions answers a lot of those initial questions. And not just initial. I mean, stuff that comes up, you know, every day in my, in, in my job. These are, you know, the kind of things we all wrestle with day to day. But this is a, a good place to begin because it's a great reference. And just to let you know, uh, Ian, the list is here on the site. All of the questions that he answers are, in fact, here. Um, Marketing-oriented questions, industry-specific and you can see every question that he he answers um, in question form before you get it, so that you won't feel like you're not right. getting something. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Don Lynch: Levels minus three dB for max level. What about the range for the rest of the those of uh, the levels? Well, the only thing I ever concern myself is with max. So minus three dB is is a standard level that most people will want your 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 max audio peaking at. And as long as you're adhering to that, uh, that's really the only number I ever pay attention to. Okay, good one. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Jeff Mills, I'm, Bill, I'm wondering, once you get a gig, how do you... Yeah, then it just... You didn't get the whole question there, Jeff, so I can't answer that. Sorry. Um, okay. Best... Paul is asking about the best market marketing system that you use. In other words, the best way to market yourself. He's just beginning to put his feelers out, he says. Well, I will say this. I believe in a multi-pronged approach. Uh, I call it the spokes of the marketing wheel. You don't want a wheel with one spoke. That makes for a very bumpy and unstable ride. You want to have multiple, multiple spokes in that wheel. Uh, and, and some of my favorites are uh, using Craigslist. Using Craigslist to find jobs has been very, very, very profitable for me. Using pay-to-play websites like Voices.com and Voice123, they have been very, very profitable for me. Um, also, and my third favorite I'll leave you with, and that is um, production companies that specialize in making TV and radio commercials. There's a bunch of them out there. And, uh, and I'm on, and I have been on a lot of those rosters, and they have been very, very profitable for me. So those are, would be three of my favorites. Okay. Now, another question here from uh, my namesake, Fred DePauli here. <laughs> who says, uh, you said to stay away from royalty-free jobs on ICX. By the way, I went on there the other day. I could not for myself 
find a job that wasn't uh, a royalty free job. In now, other words, is that uh, Fred DePauli saying that, or you're saying that, Fred? I'm, well, I went on myself. Fred's asking the question. He said, "You said to stay away from royalty free jobs on ACX. Could you elaborate on this?" When I went on ACX myself, I was looking for like you know dollar per hour kind of compensation. Right. I could find none. Now, okay, now that surprises me. I've, I've, that's never happened to me before, but I'm sure it does happen on occasion. Um, yeah. Well, here's the thing about royalty free and and Fred DePauli. By the way, hello, he's my neighbor, um, and has been in my fast track class as well. But when 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 somebody is saying what what they're trying to do, what a publisher or an author is trying to do is kind of mitigate their own risk. So they're they're saying, you know, just to make sure make sure I don't lose any money, I'm only going to pay you when I get paid, which means they don't really expect to be paid all that much. So I always take that as a signal they don't expect to sell many books. I'm not saying it always works out that way, but generally speaking, you know, I've done a lot of books on royalty share as an experiment myself. I make I get a check every month from Amazon usually between 40 and $50 a royalty check for there's like six or seven books that I've recorded on royalty share. So you, you know, you break that down. I get 10 to 12 bucks a book a month. Now, so, but, but Bill, conceivably that goes on forever, correct? Seven years. It's a seven ah, year okay. life. So if you assumed that it was the same exact amount from what you're getting now, for the next whatever five years or whatever, yeah. how much w would you have made? Well, let's say over. Let's say it's ten dollars a month for a year, one hundred and twenty a year over seven. That's so what eight hundred and forty dollars. Yeah. But something you have to figure in is a book sales tend to decline over time. Yep. Yep. So once you factor that in, uh, you know, again, I'm not saying not you won't that. make any money. Yeah. Yep. I got you. I mean, good point. I think there. Uh, okay. So now Todd Spiros is asking. Do you perform any type of warm-ups, tongue twisters, et cetera, prior to starting? I, I do. Uh, my favorite thing is humming. Uh, humming is, is a good vocal warm-up. Uh, what I do in the morning, uh, I have typically, I have more of a higher to mid-range voice uh, naturally. So what I do is I really try to warm up my lower range. Uh, so I'll, I'll come in, in the morning and go, hmm, and I'll go down as low as I can in my chest. <laughs> and I'll, and right. I'll just hum as deeply as I can. And then I'll hum up a few times and then I'll, and then I'll start my, I'll start working. I don't spend a lot of time warming up, uh, but I do start my day working on my, what I consider to be easier jobs. And then I progress into more, into more, uh, complicated and demanding work as the day wears on. Now, Bill, here's another question that I, uh, one that I haven't heard before, Humberto Franco is asking, uh, is it a good option to record low-cost voiceovers to come back to the market because he's been out of the business for about 12 years, he says. So, I'm sorry, the question is, is it best to come back doing low-cost commercials just to kind of get back into it? Yeah, in other words, yeah. do stuff sort of on the cheap, on the on the low end. Well, I, did, I, I mean, I would, uh, because you've, you need to jump in at some point and reestablish yourself. And it's hard to jump back in and say, well, I'm only doing work that pays $5,000. I mean, that's just, that's hard to do. Uh, I don't care who you are. So that I would certainly do that and then begin to, to work my way up the voiceover food chain, as it were. Uh, a question from William Schultz regarding equipment that beginners should use. Which, which program or place do we have where we discuss the full range of equipment for beginners? Um, I have a uh, I have a class called Voiceover Fast Track that I have just about every month, and we do we commit an entire night to that. Um, but in to just as as a you know as a quick answer, as, I'm sorry. The question is, what kind of equipment? The basic setup. Yeah, basic yeah. equipment for. Well, uh, you know, a, a PC or Mac. It doesn't have to be new. As a matter of fact, it doesn't need to be cutting edge. Um, it can be. I have an old one of the computers I use is like a six or seven year old Dell Optiplex. It's still in my studio. I use on occasion. Uh, but right now I'm using a Mac. But again, it doesn't matter. You need a uh, an, an audio interface. A digital audio interface, uh, that's what the equipment is called. It will connect to your computer, usually by USB. It costs about 150 bucks, And then you need a good large diaphragm condenser microphone that will plug into your digital audio interface. And th that is what you call a sound chain. That is really all you need to record with the exception of software. And uh, there's a free program, a freeware program on the market called Audacity that works in Mac and on PC. And, um, I mean, if you're looking to do this on a really low budget, that is how I would start. So, I mean, literally, you could start this on just a few hundred bucks. But make sure you get in a very quiet, well-treated room to record. 
Yep. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay. Now, David Mueller is asking, is the individual in the voiceover business responsible for the full production of the product, such as, such as commercial, or, uh, such as a commercial, or does the individual only read and record the copy? So the question is, yeah. how good do you have to give it to them? You rarely have to give full production. Now, if you if you want to specialize in that and offer that, you can, and I certainly can. But I I would tell you that over ninety nine percent of the work that I do is voice only. No music, no sound effects. Dry, what we call dry voice, meaning nothing else added. Um, and that is the way almost all clients want it because they they're doing their work on their end. They're taking your voice and adding it to their production, their video, their music. Um, occasionally you may have somebody that asks if you can do full production, but you do not have to be able to do that. It is not necessary. Okay. Sounds good to me. Let's take something else here. Somebody I haven't chosen before here. Uh, okay. So I've heard you tonight as well as your video say regularly, find a coach, find a mentor, find a coach, find a mentor. Where do you magically find these people and what would you want? Uh, and why would they want to take the time to coach or mentor you? Boy, that's that boy, that's serving up a softball for you there. Okay, since you teed it up there for me, you, I mean, that's, hey, not only am I voiceover talent, but I am a voiceover coach. You know, and it, it's funny because I, I guess I should never assume that people actually know that because I get asked that question a lot. Where can I find a coach? Uh, well, I, I am a coach, and I work with people, people in a variety of ways. And by the way, if you're interested in working with me as a coach, you can just drop me an email at voiceoverexpert at gmail.com. Uh, I do a monthly online class, so you could, wherever you live, you can join. It's a small group. Or I do one-on-one -on -one coaching, or we have these, these great programs that, like Fred was talking about, um, this uh, 100 voiceover questions. That's just one of a number of programs that I offer to help coach you virtually at a, a very cost-effectively. Good, 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 good. Okay, so now let's take another one here. Let me just grab one. Um... I guess Scott's got a good question here. What is considered cheap or low end? I wonder if he's talking about equipment or in terms of production, but let's take a look at both. Yeah. I, I, on, in terms of equipment, what would be cheap? I mean, I literally, my first studio, I had $300 into it total. That was a, what I would call a low end studio. But I, my, the, the stuff that I used was picked very carefully. And I was literally, I made a lot of money in that studio. I mean, I was making a six-figure income working in that $300 studio and was recording national ads in that studio. Um, now, on the low end in terms of pay for work, I mean, it could be, you know, it could be 20 25 bucks a commercial for small local radio stations because that's what they pay at small local radio stations um, or 50 bucks or, you know, it, it's, it's, all, it's all relative to the market and how it's being used and such. But... Um, but when it comes to like narration, long form narration, e-learning, you know, five bucks, six bucks per finished minute would be on the lower end. I have a follow up question on that. Bill. Yeah. Let's sure. say that I'm just getting started and I'm doing a lot of small jobs. Yeah. Um, given my lack of administrative abilities, I'm wondering how much money am I going to lose by forgetting the invoice? And how do you make sure which of the programs that we have would show people how to do all that administrative stuff to make sure that none of the money falls between the cracks if you don't have uh, a daughter like Mallory. <laughs> yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, um, in our voiceover revolution um, event video program, um, there was actually a, uh, a presentation that Mallory and I gave on the last day that covers a lot of that. How do you deal with invoicing clients? How do you manage work? How do you collect your money? Um, how do you, all the, you know, all of those things you talked about, the administrative back end. That is, so the, if you're looking for something like that, you would find that within this voiceover revolution event series of videos. You would just scroll down to the bottom of the page and it says something to the effect of can't make it to the event, unable to attend. Unable to yeah, there you go. So that's what we have at this point for that. Got it. There you go. So you have a, yet another way to do that. Perfect. Okay, so now um, let's take a look at the question from Gene Maldonado this, who asks, what do you think of audio interfaces that plug into iPads? 
Yeah, you know, I've known people who, who have done that and um, have done it very successfully. There is, um, and by the way, I understand that I've never used one myself, so I'm just speaking from my experience and talking with others who have. But I know that Focusrite, who's a very respected audio equipment company, has created... That's crea- what I got myself. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Focusrite actually makes a device that you can that you can dock your iPad into that you can so you can use your iPad as an audio workstation. And do you have any like is are, are the major VO talents poo-pooing that or is that okay? No, I've not yeah, no, I think it's well, I tell you, I've heard the audio and it sounds it sounds great. And I I don't know of anybody who has had any negative comments about it. And I can't imagine why they would. Okay, so um, Julie Kalen is asking, where do you find a good audio editor to edit your recordings? And I think uh, you have Bill, and then there's Bill. Yeah, I mean, in my case, you know, my my daughter Mallory, who works for me full time, uh, does a lot of my editing. Although, I mean, I, I edit a lot myself. But if if you're if you're at a level of work, meaning you're you're too busy recording to edit, and by the way, if you're not, I would suggest that you develop really good editing skills because it's not terribly Why? complicated. Uh, because you Why? can early on, you can save a lot of money. Okay. Uh, but when you're so busy working that you have to outsource it, and by the way, you're going to get stuck with stuff. There's going to be times where you're going to have to do it yourself. So it's just good to know how to do. Uh, but I would go to like a freelance type of website and, uh, or even on Craigslist and look for an audio editor. There are a lot of people out there who edit audio. Our freelance, they like Elance. Yes. Good. Um, Joanne, uh, is it Tassoni or Tassoni? I'm not sure. Uh, when is a good time to make a website? I've done work through Voices 1 through 3 for the last few months. I uh, have uh, I have one commercial demo. Should I wait until I have more demos, work samples, and clients, or should she put up her website, website yeah, now? Don't wait. Put it up You put it up now. You never want to use um, a what we call a pay-to-play site like Voices or Voice123.com as your primary website because what you're doing is you're sending clients to a portal where there are tens of thousands of more voice talent that, you know, to compete against you. So you always want to have your own website to send prospective clients to. So the focus is only on you. You want the spotlight on you, not you and 20,000 other people. Okay, next question. Again, another one from a lady. A lot of ladies on the, the, the webinar tonight. Mary asks, Mary Rembrandt, you recommend using Google Voice as a kind of phone patch. Mm -hmm. She's not been able to make this work. Can you offer up some setup suggestions? So Google Voice uh, to phone patch. Yeah. Now, you know, not being there to see your computer set up, I I don't know that I can play tech support, but but I can tell you this, that the computer, the Mac that I use is my workstation. All I have to do is I literally log into my Gmail account bring up my Google Voice, you know, the little dial pad, and I can call anybody in the world and we have can have a phone conversation, right? Right, you know, in my studio using my microphone. I've not had to do any special setup with it. So, and before coming to my seminar, Bill had to do that on a PC. God, that was Can you awesome. imagine that? Oh, the That's Stone good. Ages. Yep. Uh, okay. No, nah, this is a good one, good one too. Aaron Murphy's asking, "Do you recommend using an iPad or a touch screen to edit and view scripts. So in other words, how are you looking at a script as you do your reads? Yeah, and by the way, yeah, and I mean an iPad would be fine to do it. I'm not. I just simply use my my computer monitor. Uh, I'm mirroring, I, my, my computer is sitting out in my desk in my office and my, my little whisper room recording booth is right close to my desk. So I have an external monitor run into my booth and, I'm, and I literally do everything off my computer monitor. I record and I read scripts right off the screen. I never work with anything else. Okay, now here's another from Brian. Brian Hansen asks, are there slower or busier times of the year? For voiceovers, like holiday seasons coming up, et cetera, you know. Yeah, on, on, you know, it's it's fun. You would think holidays because of commercial work, and yeah, I may get a little more commercial work during the holidays. But generally speaking, uh, it's been very, it's been pretty smooth. I mean, the curve doesn't swing too far one way or the other at any particular um, at any particular time of year, which I found quite surprising. And I've done this full time for almost nine years now. And sometimes it'll be, you know, well, I was going to say, sometimes it's a little slow at the beginning of the year. But then, you know, like last year, I was bombarded the first two weeks of January. So it's just, it's, no, there really isn't. It's not seasonal. It really isn't. Not for me, anyhow. Okay. Um, Todd, again, has a question here. 
do you ever do auditions remotely, like if you're traveling or vacationing? If so, would you use a USB mic in those circumstances, and how well will it turn out? Well, the answer to the first question is no, I don't. Um, uh, but if I did, yeah, sure, I would absolutely use uh, a USB microphone to audition because you don't have to have pristine, super, you know, quality audio for an audition. You want to be as good as you can, uh, and it's pr perfectly acceptable to use a USB audio or USB microphone for that. Uh, back to the first question, the reason that I don't is because uh, my schedule, you know, I record pretty much nonstop from 8 in the morning until about 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon. And so when I go away... I am not interested in recording. That I I just need time off, and so uh, it's funny when I first started this, I thought I would. I thought I'd be recording everywhere, but I have not once in nine years taken equipment someplace else to record. Just and don't want to. And that's because your moniker is you're the artist worst man. I am. <laughs> that's time right. off. I need some time off. That's right. You need some chill time, some downtime. Yep, yeah, baby. you got it. Okay, there we go. Uh, let's see here. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, okay, um, so Liam Smith is asking, uh, I'd like to know what Bill recommends for types of demos to start with, and I would like to, uh, I'd like him to produce them. Well, funny you should ask. I am a demo producer. Um, I produce, I produce a lot of demos. And yeah, all you have to do is drop me an email at voiceoverexpert at gmail.com and say, uh, please give me demo information, and we'll get that to you. Um, but to your question, um, how many demos? It's important. There's one demo that's really critical that you have. Your flagship demo will be your commercial demo, because almost every client, regardless of what they use you for, will want to hear your commercial demo. So you can basically build a career around that, regardless of what kind of work you do. But it's nice, it's good, it's helpful, kind of as, as a secondary thing, having a narration demo, that's really good. And then if you decide that you want to um, pursue some more niche work over time, then you might want to look at radio imaging demo, a promo demo like TV promo, or a movie trailer demo, or an audiobook demo. Um, there's, I mean, there's those, you know, different kinds of demos like that. But when you first start commercial, by all means, commercial demo is where you absolutely need to start. Or based on what we're going to finish up tomorrow night, your character animation demo. Right, yeah. And again, another n niche area, if that's the area you're, you want to pursue. And that's more of a long-term plan, uh, but that's definitely, yes, absolutely, would be another demo. Okay, well, before we go to the next question, time for a brief commercial. So if you want to get this program on the 100 VO questions, again, all you need to do is go there to that uh, site, 100voquestions.com, and your incentive for being on the call tonight 50 off gets you $50 off that program. Back to regular scheduled program. And, and by the way, Fred, I think our plan is to try to make a special offer every time we do do this, just as our way of saying yeah, thanks. That's true. So please tell your friends, tell your relatives, and soon after the uh, after Thanksgiving, we'll be showing you a way that we're going to try and find a way to uh, help you to help us spread the word. But that more about that later. Sabrina Hawkins, I'm using Sabrina's question because Sabrina's my wife's name. Um, she asks a very nice, succinct, brief, and, and pithy question here. Do you propose, uh, do, you, do you process the file using stacks? I don't even know what the question means. Using stacks? Yes. I don't know what that means, in all honesty. Uh, okay, I apologize. So really send me a quick follow up to tell me what you're getting at with that, because I will, uh, I will in fact, listen if you want to follow up with that. So, Sabrina, send me what, what you mean by that. I think stacks might be, I'm guessing. It's it's a program or a something within a program that they call stacks. I'm guessing. Oh, oh wait, hold on. It could be. Without saying stacks are effects through twi uh, tw twitted wave. Is that oh, it? twisted wave. Twisted wave. Sorry. Oh, stop. so that's that's what they call their their audio processing. I don't use twisted wave. That's which why which is why I didn't know that. So I apologize, Thanks, Sabrina. Sam. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, let me take a moment to, ex to explain this because we're getting to some really touchy territory here. Anytime you begin to move into processing audio, by processing meaning you add effects after you've recorded, such as equalization, compression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you're potentially stepping into dangerous territory. I always recommend that once you have your studio as quiet as you can get it, 
and is well treated, meaning that you have a lot of good acoustic sound absorbing material, that you send out your signal as unprocessed as you can. If you can get by without processing it at all, nothing added, no stacks, no nothing, that is ultimately awesome because most clients want to do that on their end anyhow. Uh, that being said, some people, you know, want to do a little, a little tweaking. My suggestion is, and by the way, I do a little bit of tweaking on mine. I do a little bit of compression, a little, little bit, and a little bit of equalization. And I do it by ear. I've simply done it by ear to where it sounds good to my ear and my clients I know like it. And so it works well. If you want to get into this deeply, you really need to have a consultation with a technical expert who will take, take into consideration your room and your voice, and then you're, you know, you're getting off into a whole other thing. Less is more, though. I will say that. Less is let the room be done really well so that you don't have to do all of that stuff. I like it. All right. Okay. And now I know what stacks are. They're from Twisted that way. Uh, okay. So... Let's see here. Other questions. Hmm. Um, what do you do? This is Theus, I think, uh, Kumar. What do you do when you have a lot of errors in the script, grammatical errors or translation errors? Do you correct it yourself or ask the client to do it? That's a really good, and I'm sorry, I, I'm laughing just because I, from experience. I mean, it's the story of my life. Um, I re and most of us who do this for a full-time living, we record a lot of narration. That just seems to be the bread and butter for most full-time. I mean, you know, in addition to radio imaging and promo work and commercials, you just do a lot of narration because there's a lot of it to do. And you're going to get it from a lot of different corners of the world. And every client is going to be different. There's really no hard and fast answer. I have clients that I know that I can do some correction on the fly. And if it's minor and I can see it and it's obvious... I will correct it on the fly, but I know from experience, I have some other clients that if I make those changes, it will be thrown back to me saying that I said it incorrectly, um, which I think is a little bit amusing because I can tell that it, they weren't written by people who speak English as a first language. But if that's the, if, you know, if they want it that way, then I'll read it that way. Um, so you really have to. I, I do what seems right at the time, whatever that is, and then I, I wait to see what the client, how they respond and react. And if they like it and accept it, then I just, you know, I, I rarely ever go back to the client and ask them. I'll just do it. If, you know, if it looks like I can correct it, I'll correct it. And if they tell me to don't not correct it, then I won't. Uh, I, does that make sense? Yep, it yeah. does. Uh, another question here from Julie Kirchhoff who says, are you saying that one shouldn't use a USB mic? I think this had to do with our question about traveling. Yes, um, uh, you shouldn't use it for every day, you know, for actual project work. Um, although the technology is getting better and it's becoming more difficult to distinguish a USB mic from a large diaphragm studio mic. But uh, as a general rule of thumb, uh, I would stay away from a USB microphone in my home studio and use it only for auditioning purposes. Got it, got it, got it. Another question here about the websites. Uh, do you do it yourself? No, but no. you have somebody that can do it. Um, ask Bill about that. Just contact him, voiceover, expert at gmail.com. And let's see here if I can get something. Um, basic reason Dory is asking for, for employing compression. Why would you use compression? Well, uh, compression... Um... Com let me let me give you an example. When you listen to radio stations and you listen to the personalities on the radio and even the music on the radio, generally, usually that music and that that those voices are very compressed. They sound bigger and bolder, and they tend to pop out of the speaker. And it's because that that sound wave, for lack of a better term, is kind of squashed. It's made kind of shorter and made fatter, and it just sounds bigger and bolder. Uh, and a lot of people like the way they sound when their voice is compressed because they think it sounds more broadcast quality. Uh, broadcast people are notorious for that. The more compressed, the better. Clients, on the other hand, generally don't want that signal compressed and squashed to death. They want more air. They want it to be more open and natural sounding. The benefit of adding a little bit of compression is that it will tend to equal out the spikes in the sound wave. 
and we'll, we'll make it a little more even all the way across. So I use just a hint of compression to make the sound wave a little more even, keeps the volume a little more even all the way across. And also it does give it a little bit more of a, for lack of a better term, a finished sound and quality when you use a little bit. But when you use too much, then it starts to sound too radio and too, and too big and bold. And that's where you get into trouble. Got it. Aaron Murphy's asking, which program of yours would you have me and my partner uh, Ray coach with you before recording our first commercial demos? We're starting this business together and recording our demos around the same time. So I think probably, Aaron, my guess is, Bill, for them to contact you and for you to set this up, because chances are when you take on a demo client where you're producing a demo for someone, you usually then give them some things as part of the process, right, to to sort of coach them through what you're going to be doing. How does that work? Right. Yeah. I select it. I help them. I select the scripts for them based on, you know, who, who they are and how I can best represent them. And I work with them one-on-one. -on -one. We do a couple of one-on-one -on -one sessions uh, of training prior to that. Good. Perfect. So now, again, if, if Aaron's going to contact you, best is the voiceover expert at gmail.com. Right? You got it. Voiceover expert at gmail.com. Okay. Let's uh, keep uh, keep moving along here. Let me see here. Uh, well, I, William, William Schultz is asking a question with regards to uh, compression. Would you recommend compression for podcasting or would you use little to none of that? Because now that's a different thing. Usually if you're podcasting, you're doing it for yourself and you want it to sound as good as possible. So Bill, would yes. your answer to that be different? It would be different because you're not sending it out. You're not sending it out to somebody else for them to finish with a project. That is your, it's your finished project. So I would add a little bit of compression, not too much, but a little bit just to even out the volume and to make it pop a little bit out of the speaker. Uh, but again, I don't, you can go crazy with it. Less is more. A little bit's good. Okay. Now back to the top here. Uh, the first question here that I, I just sort of skipped over at the very beginning from Frank I, I'm not going to try and pronounce your last name, Frank. I'll butcher it. Witosh, I think. Uh, in your last seminar, you mentioned something about the fair use of commercial music on a website. Would a 30-second loop of a 10-second music sample qualify as fair use? Bill, uh, do you have your lawyer hat on? Well, yeah. And, and first of all, understand, when, when we talked about fair use, we weren't talking about music. We were talking about commercial scripts, copy. And so the fair use would apply to, to copy, to the written script. Uh, when it comes to music, that's another ball game altogether. I, I, my understanding is that music is not covered under fair use. So um, if you're using music, it needs to be what we call royalty free, meaning uh, it's, it's, it's something that you would not owe to money to somebody for the, for the right to be able to use it. Uh, that's why, like, for instance, if I'm producing a demo, I have, I sub, I, I pay for a music library, uh, you know, a massive library of thousands of songs that fits every conceivable production that are paid for and covered in terms of legal, for legal purposes. You can't just go grab a music off of a CD or off YouTube or whatever. That would be illegal. Okay, Charlie Tennyson is asking, do you have any experience with Mandy.com for VO work? Oh, yeah. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I do a, a, an extensive module on that in my uh, voiceoverplaybook.com. If you go to that website, okay. that's a whole other program that I have. Um, and just for those of you who aren't aware, Mandy.com is the biggest online database of, of media production companies in the world. Literally tens of thousands of companies are listed on Mandy.com. And uh, I have done a lot of research through Mandy, and I've made a lot of phone calls and sent emails to companies through Mandy, and I've and I've picked up clients and booked work through Mandy.com. Good. It's a great resource. Now, is that is that is that in any way? I mean, is is that you know, it's it's sort of a tough question to ask, I get, but but is Barry Manilow connected with that at all? Yeah, I think yeah. Well, I know he wrote the, the name of the website, and I think he has a, a song that goes along with it, a kind of a theme song, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Okay, George is asking, George Weaver asks, how much compression is a little bit? Three to one, two to one? Well, I, you know, it, I, I use a compressor that actually, um, again, not to, I, I, it always scares me when I start throwing out equipment and numbers. I use an Aphex 230 right now for my compression, and it has what's, what's called an Easy Rider compression uh, component that adjusts 
based on a few other parameters. But a two to one or three to one would be would be optimal, in my opinion. Okay, good. Uh, Kevin Neiman asks, what would you recommend uh, you for using noise removal in Audacity to simulate silent room if you don't have a sound booth? Well, first off, Kevin, let me tell you that I bought uh, the Chaotica Eyeball, which literally people, they have on their on their uh, site, they show people out in the middle of a field uh, using it so that you can really get pretty decent sound and pretty a pretty silent room, if you will, without having a room these days, right, Bill? Yeah, and that's a, that's a really good place to start, and that might be all that, that you need. Chances are, if if your recordings have too much background noise, uh, a lot of people mistakenly think that noise reduction software is the answer. Well, the problem with that is, is that when you're talking, that that gate is open. And so when you're talking, the noise is there. So even when you stop talking, if the noise is gone, there's it's still too noisy when you're actually speaking into your microphone. So you have a room problem. You have a noise problem. Um, ideally, you wouldn't even have to, you would not use noise reduction software. Your room would be that quiet. Uh, that being said, it's okay to use a little bit. Um, but it sounds to me like you're asking another question, too, and you're asking about room tone. Um, Fred, did he say something about utilizing silence within the recording? Um, he said, we recommend using noise removal uh, to simulate a silent room if you don't have a sound. Oh, room. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, most, most recording programs do have noise reduction software, but the problem with that is if you have to use, much like compression, if you have to use too much, it's really noticeable and it's bad. So you always start with doing everything within your power to make your room, your spa recording space as absolutely quiet as you can. Uh, answer for Tia Valor. Tia, if this is your first webinar, you just type the questions in there because we don't take any calls. It's just me and Bill answering your questions that you type in. So thank you for being here for the first time, but uh, that's how you do it. Um, what royalty-free music or FX sites do you suggest? Well, the best one that I found so far is called audioblocks.com. B L O C K A. Yeah. Yep, that's that's my favorite. There's another one called musicbakery.com. Um I've purchased some of their music as well. They they're good. Uh and there are other ones, you know, I even off the top of my head, I I, I couldn't give you another know, URLs, but uh audioblocks uh is one that I use on a regular basis. Yeah, Don, if you're getting some audio distortion in Bill's voice, it's usually as a result of your internet connection, um, not Bill's. So your, your, your voiceover, you may want to, and by the way, whenever that happens, what I always do, folks, is I go to speedtest.net. So speedtest.net will find out what your internet connection is, um, not related to uh, voiceover work, but that's a good thing to know about. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, Gene Maldonado, who asked something earlier, the voiceover playbook is jam-packed with great information. Do you think it's possible to apply it all while working a full-time job? Good question, Gene. Or do you feel like more time needs to be put in? Can you basically do this, given everything that we have to do in the voiceover business, part-time? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for using the, uh, the, the voiceover playbook. And I produced Sean's demo, by the way. Very talented guy. Um, Gene? Pardon? That's Gene Maldonado. Yeah, he, he pronounces it Sean. Oh, Sean. Okay. My yeah, phone. yeah, and yeah, good guy. And again, thanks for for asking that question and for using the playbook. And that's a really good question because what you're talking about is the thing that that everybody, most everybody, has to deal with. Now, in my situation, you know, I lost my job, so I had the luxury, if you want to call it that, of having nothing else better to do, which is pretty scary. I'd prefer to actually have a job to transition from. But you're dealing with what most other people do. So I always talk about, you know, the power of five minutes or the power of 15 minutes. When you have a plan, it is amazing what you can get done in a very short amount of time. And one thing I suggest is is using lunchtime. You know, having maybe preparing the night before, having five or ten production companies that you can contact over your your lunch hour, be it by um, by phone call or by or by email, or perhaps it's checking Craigslist for job postings. But if you if you can set aside even an, you know a half hour to an hour a day, um, you can get a lot done. The problem is this: most people do not consistently follow a plan. That's the problem. 
It's not that they don't have enough time. It's just that they don't consistently take, if there's 15 minutes you got, take 15 minutes. But if I had 30 minutes a day, I have no doubt that within a year I could build a sizable business because now, I know what to do and I would do it every day. Yeah. Let me just interrupt everyone to tell you, because I've been at, uh, at Bill's house on numerous occasions for extended periods of time. And here is Bill's plan. Let me just sum it up to you for you in two sentences. Number one, drink coffee. Number two, get into voiceover booth and record. <laughs> and then just go. Don't stop. Go. So that is basically it. That's it. Uh, good. Now, here's we have, a, we have a question from the godfather of soul, James Brown. Awesome. And James Brown asks, uh, hello, Bill. Have you done any animation VO work in the past? Have you considered it? Boy, this is really another softball being served up, given what we're about to produce here. What kind of character do you think you'd like to play? Well, uh, first of all, I don't have a big personal interest in doing character work. It's just I didn't grow up doing voices. It's not my it's not my thing. However, that being said, I was recently hired. I'm I'm the voice of some um, of some mummy. Uh, it's part of something called the League of Heroes or something. It's some animation series done out of Brazil. Uh -huh. And it's some cool DJ, you know, hey, what's happening kind of guy, you know. So I've done a little bit of that. But uh, we are in the middle of, I'm glad you asked, because we are in the middle of doing a, a webinar series with Christina uh, Malizia, who is a big-time character actor in Los Angeles. She does three characters in League of Legends right now, the biggest video game in the world. I was just hired to do, she's a character on an upcoming, uh, you know, the Disney series. Was it Doc McStuffins, I believe is the name of it? She was just hired by Disney to do that. I mean, she's at the top of her game, and that, that series is going to be available on video very, very soon. So keep keep listening for details for that. Yeah, and I'm just sending you a text right now about something we need to do on that. So anyway, okay. um, good. Uh, today's trend, John Knoll says, is the flat read. How do you get inflection and, more importantly, believability while trying to stay flat? Well, what I would encourage is this. Don't, don't focus on flat or inflection. Uh, focus on attitude and personality. Because if you focus on the technical side of it and not on the emotional side of it, then it will always sound unbelievable. Because at the end of the day, it's got the question is, do people believe you? And so when you're talking about the flat read, you're talking about something that's more like this. It's a little cooler. It's a little calmer. It's a little more emotionally distant. It's not the big hyped up, you know, big inflecting read. And that's so th what people are wanting is they're wanting something that's a little more human, a little more a little more conversational. If it's younger, again, it might be a little bit of a cooler kind of a little more emotionally distant kind of read. Or even if it's for an older audience, it might still be a little flatter, but it's it's still warm. It's still personal. So the 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 magic is not in reading flat. The magic is in expressing emotion and connecting with an audience. I hope and that I, helps you. Yeah. And Greg, by the way, Greg Crawford, uh, wanted to add to the two things to do, uh, drink coffee, um, record voice. Uh, he said, he d said, don't forget to eat donuts, to which I respond, don't worry. <laughs> uh, We've instituted something here, by the way. I, it's, it's Donut Friday. Every Friday I drive out to a, a local nice. donut establishment and get some, uh, some awesome donuts. Yeah, both Bill and I have an incredible sweet tooth, so... Um, Okay, so Mike uh, Polishuk is asking, he's heard that AS AACX is a great place to start, but I live in Canada. Any similar opportunities? We've gotten this question before, Mike, and it's a good one. What was the answer? I forget. Well, I will tell you this. Uh, you don't have to have ACX.com uh, to be successful. I, I recorded most of my, I recorded most of my audiobooks before ACX ever existed, and I did it by marketing myself directly to publishers. And... Um, that's, you know, you can build a business going directly to the people who hire them. Now, you know, nowadays a lot of publishers use ACX, but if I were in Canada and didn't have access to that, I would sim I would get online and use Google and start looking up every audiobook publisher I could, and I would begin sending out my demo. This next question is, by the way, we're getting towards the end here, folks, but this, this next question from Dory is fascinating because I have never heard it before. I'm not sure if you have. What advice would you give to someone with a quote unisexual voice meaning I guess it's sort of like the character that they always goof on from Saturday Night Live Pat. Pat. <laughs> yeah. right right now that wow that's that's a good question wow that's a really good question um I've never been asked that before I didn't think so I 
I think if you are affected, and by the way, you might want to work with a coach to get feedback as to to really where you know where you're most believable, because that's the most important question. How, how do people perceive you? How are you most believable? And if it if it works either way, I would do. I literally I would do you know a couple of demos. I do a male version and a female version, and I would work under two names. Wow, Legal. yeah, that's really cool and interesting, Dory. Good yeah, question. very much so. Uh, and thanks for one that we've never seen or heard before, because that always it makes these so much more interesting. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, Stephen is asking, kn- knowing when to pull the trigger on recording the demo, want to get it right the first time. So when do you do it, and uh, you know how do you get it right the first time? I guess. Well, well, first of all. A demo, you have to think about a demo as not a one-time event. It's something that should be done every several years throughout your career. And so it's not a matter of waiting till you get everything perfect. That's the wrong way to think about it because you'll never have it perfect. None of us will. We'd all be waiting if that was the case. We're all works in progress. However, that being said, you want to make sure that you're prepared to do the best you can with your first demo. I do believe people with a solid communication skill set do not need to wait for a year. I literally, most of the clients I work with are brand new and I have, we have them ready with a demo within a month. And uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's my opinion. That's what I suggest. You get, you have somebody work with you where you're at now. You produce a professional demo representing where you're at now. You begin to market yourself. You begin to work in every few years. You update your demo to reflect your current skill set. Perfect. Hey, last question here, and then let's uh, we'll button things up. Uh, Scott is asking, do you need to live in L.A., New York, or Texas to do animation work? Uh, no. And I tell you what, that's one of the cool things about this this character uh, success demo, that or not demo, webinar that we're doing with Christina is I, I've learned so much because it really used to be that way. And she is in L.A., and that's how she built her career. She's been doing this for 20 years. But one of the things that, that we've learned is that uh, it's expanding and the, the, you know, in terms of toys, digital products, there's a lot more application for character voice and it's not only central to LA anymore. Now, if you want to do only Nickelodeon type stuff and, you know, Saturday morning cartoons on ABC, if that, or Fox animation domination, you may, if that's the only thing you're interested in, you may need to be in Los Angeles for that because it's a very small pool to swim and it's very competitive. Uh, but in terms of the rest of the universe of work available, no, you can live just about any place and do it. Well, speaking of living any place and doing anything, this is Fred Gleek from the Los Angeles area, Santa Clarita, California, and Bill Deweese from the Bourbon, Illinois, home of the training camp of the Chicago Bears, now playing ridiculous football. Oh, gosh, don't even start with that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, folks, for listening. And, uh, Bill, make sure and give me a call after we're done. But, everyone, thank you very much for being here. We'll Thanks, do guys. these every couple of weeks, so we'll see you again right after Thanksgiving. I hope everyone has a happy Thanksgiving. And, Bill, thank you very much for uh, your time. Thanks, Fred. We'll see you next time. Good night. Good night.